question one. So we're told that the mean of x10 and y is 11. So when we add these three numbers up and then divide by the numbers, which is three, we get uh, 11. So what must the numbers add up to? Well, they must add up to 33 because 33 divided by the number of numbers, which is three, has got to equal 11. So we know that x plus 10 plus y is 33. So taking 10 away from both sides, we know that x plus y must equal 23. So that's an equation we've got from this first fact about the mean. Now, moving on to the second fact, we're told that the range is 7. Now, the range is the biggest number, take away the smallest number. We're, we're told these are in order of size, so the biggest number's got to be y, the smallest number has got to be x. So the difference between these two numbers has got to be 7. So y take away x has got to equal 7. Now if I just make that a bit easier to work with and add x to both sides, I get y equaling 7 plus x. And that's my second equation. So I've now got two equations and two unknowns. So we've got a simultaneous equation to solve. Now I've solved this by just substituting the second equation into the first equation. So I'm replacing uh, the y in the first equation with 7 plus x because that's equal to y. So x plus y is 23 but y is equal to 7 plus x. So here's an equation with just x in it. So to simplify it, so we've got 2x, take away 7 from both sides, we've got 2x equaling 16. So x has got to equal 8. And then taking either equation, I'm taking the first one, my x plus y equals 23. I've just worked out that x is 8. So 8 plus y equals 23, so y equals 15. Now I thought that was a pretty difficult opening question, so don't panic if you uh, found that quite, quite tricky. That is not that straightforward. Question two. So we're given the formula that pressure equals force over area. Now we're gonna to have to work out the force, so let's rearrange this to make force the subject. So if we multiply both sides by area, we get, we get force equaling pressure times area, or area times pressure. So force equals pressure times area. So we need to work out the pressure and we need to work out the area. Well, we're told the pressure. We're told that the pressure is 42. So we now just need to work out the area. Well, the area of a rectangle is obviously base times height. So two times 1.25, which is 2.5. So force equals pressure times area, pressure is 42, area is 2.5, multiply them together, we get 105 newtons. So no complications here, all the units all nicely sat together. The pressure was in new newtons per meter squared. Our area is meters squared once we've multiplied these together and our final answer had to be in newtons. So there was no complications with us needing to fiddle around with the units. Question three. So here we've just got to wade our way through the, the various facts. So she is 6.3 kilograms of wax. Now we're going to be wanting to work in grams, or I'm going to choose to work in grams, because that's what we're telling you about. That's how they tell you each candle uh, uses 210 grams. So it's best to work in grams. So turning 6.3 kilograms into grams, we multiply by a thousand, a thousand grams in a kilogram. So we've got 6,300 grams of wax, each candle using 210 grams. So if we divide those, we get, the, we get that we can make 30 candles. Now we're told that uh, she sells uh, two-fifths of these for $13 each. Now two-fifths of 30, we can just simply put that into our calculator two-fifths times 30. So that's going to be 12 candles that we're selling at $13 each. 12 times 13 is $156. Now we're told that she reduces the candles by 20% and sells the rest at this price. So how many candles does she sell at this reduced price? Well, she's made 30. She sold 12 at the full price. So 30, 30 take away 12 gives us 18 candles being sold at the reduced price of 20%. Now what is the reduced price of 20%? Uh, if we're uh, taking off 20%, then we're leaving on 
80%. So we're selling at 80%. Now 80% gives us a multiplier of 0.8. 80%, 80 out of 100, 80 over 100 is 0.8. So we can work out our reduced price by taking our full price of $13 and multiplying it by 0.8, giving us $10.40. That's the reduced price. So we sell 18 candles at this reduced price of $10.40 giving us $187.20. So we made 156 selling the 12 candles at full price. We made 187.20 selling the 18 candles at the reduced price. So if we add these two amounts of money together, we get $343.20. Question four, part A, we've got to expand and simplify this. Now, so to expand, we've got to get rid of the brackets. We've got to multiply out the brackets. So we're going to do 3 times C, 3 times minus 7, uh, 2 times 3C, and plus 2 times plus 4. So 3 times C is 3C, 3 times minus 7 is minus 21, plus 2 times 3C is plus 6C, and plus 2 times plus 4 is plus 8. So we've expanded. That gives us one mark. And now we've got to simplify, we've got to gather like terms. So gathering up the C's, we've got 3C plus 6C is 9C. And gathering up the normal numbers, minus 21 plus 8 is minus 13. Part B, expand and simplify. So we've got a pair of brackets here. So the clause is slightly different. We've got the X times the X, the X times the minus 2, then moving on to the plus 7 the plus 7 times the x and the plus 7 times the minus 2. So working through those four clause in turn, x times x is x squared, x times minus 2 is minus 2x, 7 times x is plus 7x, and 7 times minus 2 is minus 14. So there's one mark for expanding. Now simplifying, the only like terms here are the x's in the middle, so those are the only terms that can be gathered together. So our final answer is going to be x squared. Then gathering together the x's, we get plus 5x, and then the minus 14 on the end. Part C. Now, factorize means putting in the brackets. And the fact that it's saying we've got to factorize fully means we're going to be taking out more than one component out of the brackets. So it's going to be a number and a letter. So just watch out when it says fully. It's, it's warning you that you've got to be taking more than one thing out of the bracket. So what's our highest common factor of 28 and 21? Well, that's 7. So we can take a 7 outside the bracket. And what's our highest common factor of y squared and y? Well, that's y. So we take the y outside the bracket. Open up the brackets. Now, 7y times what gives us 28y squared? Well, we need the 4 to get the 7 4s of 28, and we need the y to get the y times y being y squared. Now get the sign right, we need it to be a minus, and then 7y times what gives us 21y, well that's 3, because 7 3s are 20, 21. Now these are easy to check, just expand this and check you get back to where you started. 7y times 4y is indeed 28y squared. And 7y times minus 3 is minus 21y. Part D. So we have to solve this. So let's start off by undoing this division. So we're going to choose to multiply both sides by 4. So on the left, this just leaves us with the 7x minus 2 when we've undone the dividing by 4. And then multiplying each of the terms on the right by 4. 4 lots of 3x is 12x and 4 lots of 1 is plus 4. So we've got 7x minus 2 equaling 12x plus 4. Now, we're doing two things here. I was running out of space a bit, so I perhaps could have made this a bit clearer. We're choosing to take away 7x from both sides, and at the same time we're choosing to take away 4 from both sides. So this gets all the x's to the right and all the normal numbers to the left. So that gives us minus 6 equaling 5x, and divide both sides by 5, we get x equaling minus 6 over 5. Question 5. 
So um, we've got to work out the distance the plane flew. Now speed equals distance over time. You just need to learn that. We need to work out the distance. So we need to make distance the subject. So let's choose to multiply both sides by time. So we get distance equaling speed times time. Uh, the distance we're told is 600, sorry, excuse me. The speed we're told is 650 kilometers per hour. And now we just need to work out the time. Now the time is six hours, 42 minutes. Now be ever so careful here. That does not equal, equal 6.42 hours because there are not, um, there are not 100 minutes in an hour. Obviously there are 60 minutes in an hour. So we need to turn this 42 minutes into a proportion of an hour. So to do that, we do 42 divided by 60. Pop that into your calculator or just you can just see it's simply, you can divide through by six. That's seven tenths of an hour, which is 0.7 of an hour. So six hours, 42 minutes is 6.7 hours. So that's what we use for the time. 650 multiplied by 6.7 gives us 4355 kilometers. Question six. So we're investing 20,000 rupees. So we have our 20,000. Now the compound rate of interest is 1.5%. So this gives us a multiplier of 1.015. Had it been 2%, it would be 1.02, 5%, 1.05. But because it's 1.5%, it's 1.015. So make sure you're comfortable creating a multiplier from a given rate of interest. Now, because we've invested it for three years, our power is three. Now, pop that all into your calculator, you get this. So to the nearest rupee, that's going to be 20,914. Question seven. So I think it's best just to break uh, the components down. So we've really got 20 divided by four, x squared divided by x squared, and y to the power of six divided by squared. So do each of them in turn. So 20 divided by four is obviously five. Uh, anything divided by itself is just one. No, four divided by four is one and so on. So x squared divided by x squared is just one. So five times one is five. And then uh, y to the power of six divided by y squared. Now remember when you're dividing, you subtract the powers. Six take away two is four. So that's y to the power of four. Part B, so we have to make E the subject. So we've got to move from it being H equaling stuff to E equaling stuff. So we need to rearrange the right hand side so we're just left with E on its own. So start off by undoing the term not involving the E. So we need to undo this plussing of F by subtracting F from both sides. So H minus F equals just the three E. And now we need to undo this three. Now this is three times E, E times three. So we need to undo the timesing by three by dividing by three. And to make it clear that it's the whole of the left-hand side divided by three, write it down as H minus F all over three. Then on the right-hand side, when we've divided by three, we've undone the three, leaving us with just E. So E equals H minus F all over three. Question eight. So a sketch will just help us gather our thoughts. So from A, we walk 200 meters due east to B. And then from B, we walk 160 meters due south to C. And we're being asked to work out the length of AC. So we've got a right angle triangle here, side, side, find a side, so it's Pythagoras. We're working out the hypotenuse, the longest side, so it's adding Pythagoras. So AC squared equals 200 squared plus 160 squared. Uh, so AC squared equals 65,600. Square root both sides, you get 256.124 dot, dot, dot. So to three significant figures, that just means three digits in total. Our final answer is 256. Question nine. So exam strategy, just fill in as much as you can on the diagram, just picking up um, method marks as you go. So let's start off with this pentagon here. 
It's this five-sided shape. Now it's a regular shape. We know that exterior angles always add up to 360. So this exterior angle here must be 360 divided by 5, which is 72. Now once you know the exterior angle, the interior angle is easy because exterior plus interior equals 180. Angles on a straight line add up to 180. So all the angles on the interior of this pentagon are 108, including this one here. Similar process for this octagon here, this eight-sided shape, regular octagon. So the exterior angle here must be 360 divided by eight, which is 45. So the interior angle must be 180, take away 45, which is 135. So all of these interior angles are 135, including this one here. Now, looking at angle B here, angles about a point add up to 360. We've got the 108, we've got the 135, so B must be what takes us up to 360. So this angle here at B is 360 minus 108 minus 135, which is 117. Now, consider triangle CBF. This is, um, uh, uh, we're told that this triangle is an isosceles triangle. So this length from C to B is the same as the length from B to F. So with an isosceles triangle, the base angles are equal. Let's call it X. So angles in a triangle add up to 180. So these two together must be 180 take away 117. Split this equally between the two. So half that, we get 31.5 degrees. Question 10. So we've got to work out this angle here. Now the easiest way to do this is to break this compound shape down into two simple shapes. So if I put down this dotted line here, then I've got a rectangle and a triangle. And the angle um, X that I need to work out is going to comprise this corner of the rectangle, so 90 degrees, plus this little acute angle here, which I'm calling Y. So I'm going to start off by trying to work out the angle of Y. I'll then add 90 to it later on to give me the angle X. So just think about the triangle from C to E to D with this little acute angle Y. Now this length from C to E has got to be the same as the length from B to A because it's a rectangle. So that's 12.5. And the length from E to D is going to be 24.3 take away 16, which is 8.3. So now I can just use Sokotoa on this right angle triangle to work out this angle Y. Now the two sides that I have are opposite and adjacent, so I'm going to be using tan. So tan Y equals my opposite side of 8.3 divided by my adjacent side of 12.5. Inverse tan both sides to make Y the subject. Pop this into your calculator and you get the acute angle Y being 33.58 dot dot dot. Add on this 90 degrees and we get X being 123.58 dot dot dot, which to one decimal place is 123.6. Question 11. So part A, write down the modal class. Well, modal means most. So what happens most often? What has the biggest frequency? Well, our biggest frequency is 36. And this happened when the amount of money spent was between 100 and 200. So you need just to copy down that left-hand side exactly. Now, cumulative frequency gives us a running total. So how much money was spent um, between 0 and 100 pounds? Well, that's the 10, just copying down that number. But what about between 0 and 200 spent? Well, that's going to be the 0 to 100 and the 100 to 200. So that's the running total of the top two numbers added together. 10 add 36 is 46. Similarly with 0 to 300, that's the 0 to 1, the 100 to 200, and the 200 to 300. So that's the top three added together to give us the 80, and so on. The 400, uh, the, 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 um, that 100 there is the top four numbers added together. That 115 is the top five added together. And that 120 is all of them added together. So these, the cumulative frequency is a running total as you go from naught to the upper boundary. Now for part C, we have to draw the cumulative frequency graph. Now for that, you've just got to learn, you always prop, uh, plot the upper bound and the cumulative frequency. So the points I have plotted here are 110, 
and 246, 380 and so on. And then that gives you this sort of gentle falling over S curve. Now for part D, use your graph to find an estimate for the interquartile range. Well, the interquartile, quarters, quartile, that is the, um, that range is between where you have 75% and 25%. So 25%, 25% of the 120 families is 30, and then 75% is three lots of this, which is 90. So we go and take a reading for both 30 and 90 off our cumulative frequency graph, and I've got 350 and 170. So take 170 away from 350 and I've got 180. Now the answer scheme does allow a range of answers and the answer scheme on this occasion allowed answers between 175 and 205. So as long as your answer is backed up by your graph, you'll be fine. Now for part E, use your graph to find an estimate for the number of families that spent more than 450 pounds. So take your 450 pounds Take a reading, and I've got 108. So how many of the 120 families spent more than that? Well, so the more than 450, so above the 208. So there I've just done 120, take away 108, giving me, giving me 12. The mark scheme allowed either 12 or 13. Question 12. So we've got to work out the angle from A to D to C. So this angle up here. So first thing to take on board is the angle between a tangent and a radius is always 90 degrees. So this angle from O to C to B and O to A to B are both 90 degrees. Now, once I know those two angles, and of course I know this one, if I'm looking at the quadrilateral, the, the four-sided shape OCBA, then those angles have to add up to 360, and I know three out of four, so I can go and work out the fourth one, the angle COA, this angle here, to be 106 degrees. So this angle here is 106, I need to work out this angle here, and to do that I'm going to use one of the circle theories which says that the angle at the circumference is half the angle at the centre. So because my angle at the centre is 106, the angle at the circumference, ADC, is half of this, which is 53 degrees. Question 13. So let's start off with our line L1 and work out what the gradient of this line was. So if we rearrange this into y equals mx plus c format, so really I'm just switching these two terms round, I'm getting y equals minus 2x plus 6. Now remember, y equals mx plus c, so 6 is where it crosses the y-axis, and m, the gradient of my line L1, is minus 2. Now my line L2 is perpendicular to L1, so how do I work out the gradient of a perpendicular line? Well, I sort of swap it over and change the sign. So think of this as being minus 2 over 1. So flip that over, I now get 1 over 2, change the sign, and I get a half. So the gradient of L2 is a half. These two gradients multiplied together will always give you minus 1. The gradients of perpendicular lines, when you multiply them, gives you minus 1. So I know the gradient of my line L2 is a half, and I'm being told it passes, um, my, straight my straight line L2 passes through the point 4, 7. So I know its gradient is a half, and one of the points on it is 4, 7. So using the formula y minus y1 equals m x minus x1, I can now work out the, for, the uh, equation of the line L2, because I know both the gradient m, a half, and a point x1, y1 being 4, 7. So substituting my half, my 4, and my 7 into the equation, I get this. I've then multiplied out the right-hand side to give me y minus 7, equals 0.5x minus 2, 
adding 7 to both sides, I get my final equation being y equals 0.5x plus 5. Now what I'm being asked is find the coordinates to the point where the line L2 crosses the x-axis. Now it crosses the x-axis when y equals 0. So substituting y being 0 into this equation, I get 0 equaling 0.5x plus 5. Take away 5 from both sides, multiply by 2, I get x equaling minus 10. So the coordinate where it crosses the x-axis is minus 10, 0. Question 14. Now, here I need to get all my base numbers being the same. So that's going to be 2. It's the smallest number here. So 128 is 2 to the power of 7. So just work that out in your fingers. 2 twos are 4, times 2 again is 8, then 16, then 32, then 64, then 128. So 128 is 2 to the power of 7. Now, changing um, the base number 4 here to being 2 squared, rather than having 4 to the power of 2x, I've got 2 squared all to the power of 2x. And then my final term, I'm just leaving as 2 to the power of x. So all of my base numbers are the same now. They're all 2. Next step, let's just um, multiply this out here. So where we've got a power on the inside of the bracket and a power on the outside of the bracket, we multiply these together. So 2 lots of 2x is 4x. So I've now got 2 to the power of 7 equaling 2 to the power of 4x multiplied 2 to the power of x. Now I can just use the index law that when I'm multiplying, and I've got the same base, the base number, I add the powers. So when I add these powers together, 4x plus x, that gives me 7. So this is just focusing in on the indices. 7 equals 4x plus x. So it's simplifying the right-hand side, 7 equals 5x. Dividing through by 5, I get x equaling 7 over 5, equaling 1.4. Question 15, part A. So work out the numbers, which is A union B. So that's union means A or B or both. So in A, we've got the 7 and 3. In B, we've got the 3, the 8 and the 1. So the 7, 3, 8 and the 1 are in A or B or both. So adding those up, I get 19. Now for part 2, I'm looking for what's both not A and also C. So it's got to be not in A but in C. Intersection means both of these have to be satisfied. So what's not in A but also in, in C? So what's not in A but, but also in C? Well, that's all of C, because all of C, none of A is in C. So basically, what is in both not A and also in C is what's in C. So that's the 1 plus the 4, which is the 5. Now, part 3, I'm looking for the numbers which are either not in A or not in B. So either or, or both. So what's not in A? Well, what's not in A is the 8, the 1, the 4, and the 9. What is in A is the 7 and the 3. So what's not in A is everything else. So that's the 8, the 1, the 4, and the 9. So don't forget the 9. So either not in A or not in B. What's not in B? Well, we're picking up a lots of the ones that we had before, but we're also now picking up this 7 over here. That's not in B. So quite frankly, we want everything apart from this three here. Okay, Everything else is either not in A or not in B. So adding these together, we get 29. So question 16, we've got to work out when she adds the three numbers together that her total is an odd number. So let's just think about how we get an odd number if we're adding three numbers together. We're going to get an odd if we have three odds. So just think about any three odds added together. You're still going to get an odd number. 
Or the other way you're going to end up with an odd number is when you get two evens and an odd. And that can happen three different ways. Two evens and an odd. So I'm going to work my way through in turn working out the pro probability of each of these four scenarios. So the first one, what's the probability of an odd and then another odd and then another odd? Well, I've got five odds and three evens. So an odd, then an odd, then an odd is going to be five out of seven, five out of eight, sorry. Then once an odd's gone, it's then going to be four out of seven. And then when another odd's gone, it's going to be three out of six. So multiply the numerators, multiply the denominators, I get 60 out of 336. Now moving on to an odd, then an even, then an even. So an odd is going to be 5 out of 8. Then an even is going to be 3 out of 7. And then another even would be 2 out of 6, giving me 30 over 336. And then just the same again. The probability of an even, then an odd, then an even is 3 out of 8 multiplied by 5 over, over 7 times 2 over 6. And then fourth scenario, even, even, odd, 3 over 8 times 2 over 7 times 5 over 6. So work out those, fours indiv those four options individually, add them together, I get 150 over 336. I didn't have to simplify it because it doesn't ask me to, but if you did, the simplified answer of 25 over 56 is, of course, fine as well. Question 17, part A. So, um, just got to learn the process here. We start off by letting x equal, equal the uh, recurring number. So that's the 0 0.436, 36, 36, and so on. Do remember to put in the dots to, to make it clear you appreciate this is recurring. Now, because we have the two dots, we're going to choose to multiply by 100 with the two zeros. So multiplying both top, uh, both left and right by 100, we get 100x equaling, now because we're multiplying by 100, all of these numbers move over 2. So that gives me 43.63636. Again, don't forget the dots. And what you will now see that the recurring component lines up. So when we take equation 2, the bottom one, and we take away equation 1, we get 99x equaling exactly 43.2 because the three take away three is zero, the six take away six is zero, and so on. Now at this point, just as a nicety, please don't divide through by 99. We don't wanna have in the workings a combination of a decimal and a fraction. So just to get rid of this decimal at this point, please multiply by 10 first, giving us 990x equaling 432. Now you're fine to make x the subject by dividing by 990 giving us 432 over 990, which simplifies to 24 over 55, as required. Now part B, we're going to start off by simplifying these two thirds in the numerator. So root 20 is root 4 root 5, which is 2 root 5. And root 80 is root 16 root 5, which is 4 root 5. Now remember the thought process here. You're trying to break it down into two numbers, one of which is the biggest square number that you can think of. So with 20, you don't want to go 2, 10, 2 times 10, because neither square. So that's why it's 4 times 5. Similarly with the 80, you don't want to go 8 times 10, because neither square. Also, you don't want to go 4 times 20 because 4 isn't the biggest possible um, square number. 16 is. So that's why we've gone 16 and 5. So at this point, we have simplified the numerator. Now we want to rationalize it and get rid of the square root and the denominator. So we choose to multiply top and bottom by the denominator, which is the root 3. So that's going to give us, when we multiply the numerator, we're going to get 6 root 5 root 3, which is 6 root 15. And then when we multiply the denominators, root 3 times root 3 is root 9, which is 3. Now we've got 6 times root 15 over 3. So that's 6 over 3 times root 15, which is 2 root 15. And normally that's, that's probably where we would stop because we would have simplified it as much as possible. But we've been asked on this occasion to express it in the form of a, of a single um, 
uh, third. So we don't want to have the number in front. So if anything, we're unsimplifying it now. So we, we want to put it back to being a, a single square root. So we need both of these components to be square roots. So two is the square root of four. And now we can combine them under the same third. So that's root 60. Four times 15 giving us root 60. And that's our final answer. Question 18. Well, we clearly have a simultaneous equation here. Now, because they're not both linear, because we've got squares involved in one of them, we can't just sort of line them up and eliminate by adding or subtracting them. So on this occasion, to solve this, we're going to have to use substitution, whereby we substitute the linear one, the simpler one, into the more complicated nonlinear one. So we're going to replace this x here with what x is equivalent to. So rather than x squared, we're going to have 2y minus 3 all squared. So we're simply substituting in. We're going to go and pop this here into this here. So the key bit here is this first line, making sure you understand how I've got to here. Now, from now onwards, we just need to solve it because we've clearly only got one unknown, which is the y. So this is now solvable to work out y. So we start off by multiplying out this bracket. 2y minus 3 all squared means 2y minus 3 times 2y minus 3. I've done the claw, 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 claw over here and simplified it to get my 4y squared minus 12y plus 9. So my 2y minus 3 all squared is replaced by this. I can then multiply each of these terms by 2, giving me this line. And then I've just tidied it up. So I've simplified my left-hand side by uh, gathering my y squared. So my 8y squared plus my 3y squared is my 11y squared here. Now I can now go and um, get it in a format where I can solve it by making it equal to naught. So at this point I've chosen to take away 14 from both sides, giving me this um, quadratic equation here. Now this doesn't factorize, so I'm going to use the quadratic formula where a, the coefficient of the y squared is 11, b is the coefficient of y which is minus 24, and c is the number on the end which is the 4. So using this quadratic formula, substituting in, I get my y value being 24 plus or minus 20 all over 22. So that gives me two possible answers, once when I'm adding the 20, once when I'm subtracting the 20. So my two possible values for y are 2 and 2 over 11. Now I need to now work out the x coordinates for each of these. So I could simplify, uh, substitute this into either, but clearly it's going to be a lot easier if I choose to substitute into the simpler linear format. So I know x equals two lots of whatever y is minus three. So when y is two, I get x being one. And when y is 2 elevenths, I get x being minus 29 over 11. So those are my two pairs of possible answers. Question 19. So on a bounds question like this, I think it makes sense just to work out the lower bound and the upper bound of each of these three variables. So what's the smallest number p can be? when it would still round to 8.4 to two significant figures, and that's 8.35, upper bound 8.45. And similarly with Q, lower bound, upper bound, and T, lower bound and upper bound. So just be clear in your mind what we're saying here. These are the lowest possible values, uh, actual values, that if you round to two sig figs, you end up getting these numbers here. And then just got to be slightly relaxed with the fact we've said, for example, 8.45. At 8.45, we would round up to 8.5. So the true answer should really be 8.449 recurring. But that's so close to 8.45, for the purposes of bounds questions, they like you to maintain the symmetry. So this is 0 0.05 below 8.4. So the upper bound should be uh, 0.05 above the 8.4 and so on. So just remember that these upper bounds are just slightly overstated, but that those are the numbers we should, we should be working with. 
Now, we want to make A as big as possible. We want the upper bound for A. So think about it. To get it as big as possible when we've got a fraction, we want the biggest possible number into the numerator divided by the smallest possible number as the denominator. So T has to be the lower bound. Now we want this numerator overall to be as big as possible. Now when you're subtracting, to make it as big as possible, you want to have the biggest possible number to start with and then take away the smallest possible number. That overall will make that as big as possible. So in short, we want the upper bound of P minus the lower bound of Q all over the lower bound of T. So substituting in the appropriate numbers from up here, we get this. Popping that into our calculator, we get this. So to one decimal place, that is 8.3. Question 20. So to start with, we need to factorise this. So let's just factorise it, letting it equal zero. So how do we factorise a quadratic when we have the coefficient of x squared being greater than one? Well, this is how we do it. We have to think of uh, the two magic numbers that multiplied equal the four times the minus six, so equal the minus 24, but at the same time add to be the coefficient of x, which is minus five. So what two numbers satisfy this? Well, that's minus eight and three, because minus eight times three is minus 24, but minus eight plus three is minus five. Now we can't go straight to final answer here. What will we do to start with is split this x term down into minus eight and three. Doesn't matter which way around. I've done the minus eight x first and the plus three x second, but you could do it the other way around. So at this point, in a way, we seem to have made things more difficult for ourselves. We've gone from three terms to four terms. But from now, now onwards, it, it becomes quite straightforward. The next step is to fully factorize the first two terms, which I've done here, and then fully factorize terms three and four, which I've done here. And, and have a care to make sure that this bracket is repeated. So you might just have to fiddle around with this sign a bit. And then your final pair of brackets comprises the two components which are not in a bracket at the beginning. So the 4x plus 3 and the repeated bracket. So that is our factorised um, uh, that, that, that quadratic. And it's sort of a, a uh, sort of a forced process going this direction, but it makes a lot of sense going the other way. If we were multiplying this out, we would do the 4, 4x times the x minus 2 then the plus 3 times the x minus 2, that's all I've done here. Then you would multiply out, claw, 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 which I've done here. And then to get up here, you just gather your like terms, which we've done here. So it makes a lot of sense going the other way, but it does take quite a bit of practice to be able to go, it, to go this way around. Anyway, so we want this to be equaling 0. So in turn, each of these brackets has to be 0, because 0 times whatever is 0, or whatever times 0. Is zero. So what, what value of x makes this first bracket zero? So 4x plus 3 has to equal zero. Take away 3 from both sides, divide by 4, we see that x would be minus 3 quarters. And what makes this bracket zero? Well clearly that's x being 2. So a little sketch now I think helps gather our thoughts. So we know our solutions when it equals zero are at minus 3 quarters and plus 2. Because this is a positive um, x squared, we're going to get a positive parabola, a smiley face curve. And we're looking for the set of values where x is greater than zero. So all the values, the stretcher points above the x-axis. So this stretcher points here is when x is less than minus three quarters. And this stretcher points here is when x is greater than two. Two separate stretches of points. So two separate answers, please. Question 21. With part A, the um, transformation is outside the function. It's not in the bracket, it's on the outside. So this affects the Y coordinates and does it exactly as it says on the tin. So this is gonna be doubling all the Y coordinates. 
So if we take a couple of the key points, for example, minus 2, minus 1, and 1, 3, we're going to be doubling the y coordinates, leaving the x coordinates alone. So that gives us minus 2, minus 2, and 1, 6. So you can see what's happening here. We're having a stretch in the, um, in the uh, vertical direction. So that's the curve that we get. Because this point here, we're going to be doubling the y coordinate. 4 minus 1 becomes 4 minus 2. Now, with part B, this is inside the function. So um, affects the x coordinates, but does really normally it does the opposite to you what, what you would expect. So say this had been 2x inside the function, we would halve the x values, or had it been half x inside the function, we would have doubled the x values. But because we've got minus x, or effectively minus 1x here, we're going to be just changing the sign of the x values. Okay? So it doesn't sort of have the opposite effect other than just changing the sign. So here, um, our x values are just going to change their sign. So if we take the three key points, minus 2, minus 1, 1, 3, and 4, minus 1, we're simply reversing the sign of the x coordinates. So minus 2 becomes plus 2, 1 becomes minus 1, and 4 becomes minus 4. The y coordinates are unchanged. So if we go and plot those, we get this. So you can see on this occasion, we're just getting a, a reflection in the, um, in the y-axis. Question 22. So lots going on here. So I'm going to start off by fully factorizing the numerator and the denominator of this first term. So the numerator is the difference between two squares. So that's 2x plus 5 and 2x minus 5. Now with the denominator, we're um, factorizing a quadratic where the x squared, uh, the coefficient of the x squared is not 1. So a bit similar to a question or two beforehand. So I've gone through that process over here of factorizing this. And so that factorized is 5x plus 7 and x minus 1. So this bit here is fully factorizing this term here. Now, on the, uh, within the brackets, we are going to be subtracting fractions, so we need to have a common denominator. Now, our common denominator is going to be x minus 3, 2x minus 5. So with this first term here, we're going to have to choose to multiply top and bottom by 2x minus 5. And with this second term here, we're going to choose to multiply top and bottom by x minus 3. So now that we've got the common denominator, we can combine the numerators. So I've got 2 times 2x, which is 4x, 2 times minus 5, which is minus 10, minus 3 times x, which is minus 3x, and minus 3 times minus 3, which is plus 9. Then simplifying my numerator, 4x minus 3x is x, and minus 10 plus 9 is 1. So I've now got this fully um, simplified. A whole bunch of stuff being multiplied on the top, a whole bunch of stuff being multiplied on the bottom. So I can now cancel out factors. So this 2x minus 5 cancels with this 2x minus 5, and this x minus 1 cancels with this x minus 1. So I'm left with 2x plus 5 in the numerator, and 5x plus 7, x minus 3 as the denominator. Question 23. Now, I thought this was pretty tough. So, let's start off by trying to get a diagram together to help us gather our thoughts. So, we've got OA being vector A, and we're told that C is the midpoint of OA, so if you like, that length there is 1. And that length there is 1. Now we're then told that um, for, for our, um, we've got O to B and we've got A to B and we're told that D is the point on AB such that AD to B, DB is 3 to 1. So that length AD to DB is 3 to 1. And then we're then told that E is the point such that the length OB OB is twice the length BE. So BE is a length of 1, 
and OB is a length of 2. So that vector BE, when you double it, you get the vector OB. So that was hard, I thought, to actually get the diagram clear. And then we're being asked to use a vector method to prove that the points C, D and E lie on the straight line, on the same straight line. Now, how do we do this? What we've got to do, we've got to find the vector C, D and find the vector D and prove that they are parallel. And once they're parallel, we can just say, well, they're parallel. They both go through the common point D, so they must be on the straight line. So we're going to start off by working out the vector C, D then work out the vector DE and then show that they're parallel. So let's work out the vector CD. So how am I going to get from C to D? I'm going to go C to A and then A to D. Now, um, what I'm going to want to do then is to move over to putting these vectors in lowercase a and b format. So I need to be able to convert these into my uh, lowercase a and b format. Now c to a is going to be easy, c to d, uh, a, to d, a to d is not so straightforward. So how do I get from a to d? Well a to d is 3 quarters of a to b. I can see that it's 3 out of 4 miles if you like. And so it's 3 quarters of a b. But what is a b? a b is a minus a plus b. Going from a to b, if I go down here the wrong way, minus a plus b, that is my a to b. So a to d is 3 quarters of that, 3 quarters of minus a plus b. Now 3 quarters of minus a plus b, when you multiply that out, gives you minus 3 quarter a plus 3 quarters b. So back to my c to d, I'm going to go c to a, which is half an a. Remember a is all the way up. So this is just half of that, half an A, plus my AD, which was minus 3 quarters A plus 3 quarters B from up here. Um, gathering like terms, a half A to take away 3 quarters A is minus a quarter A. So I've got C to D being minus quarter A plus 3 quarters B. So let's just bank that for now. So we've got the vector to get from C to D. I'm now going to start again and get the vector from D to E. Now D to E is going to be D to B and B then to B to E. Now D to B, really following on from up here, D to B is a quarter of A to B. It's 1 out of 4. So that's a quarter of minus A plus B. So minus a quarter A plus a quarter B. So going from uh, D to E, I'm going to go D to B which is my minus a quarter A plus a quarter B, then B to E. Now that's half of A, O to B, so half of B. So that's half of B. Gathering up my like terms here for B, I get minus a quarter A plus three quarters B. Now what I found here is not only is C, D and D parallel, they're actually the same vector. So, um, so they're the same vector. So obviously they're going to be parallel if they're the same vector. So I can conclude that C to D and D to E are parallel. They're through the common point D, so therefore C, D and E lie on the same line. Difficult question that, I think. Question 24, part A. So this is just a um, completing the square. So start off, this is probably the key bit, it's hard to complete the square when you've got a minus x squared. So basically choose to multiply through by minus 1 to start with. So if we just reverse all the signs, we've got an x squared plus 4x minus 7. So really think of this as being minus 1 times each of these. Then if you multiply that out, you get back to where we started. Now it's then easy to complete the square on this. We halve the coefficient of the 4x to give us 2. So x plus 2 all squared. Well, x plus 2 all squared would give us x squared plus 4x plus 4. So to back out that plus 4, we pop in a minus 4. So these, this part here, x plus 2 all squared minus 4, is equal to x squared plus 4x. So just make sure you're clear on that. That part there is the same as that part there. Because x plus 2 all squared is x squared plus 4x plus 4, then minus the 4 
So we've just got x squared plus 4x. And then we've got a minus 7 on the end. Gathering up the minus 4 and the minus 7, we get minus 11. And then at this point, really multiply through by the minus again. So we've got minus x plus 2 all squared. Then minus minus 11 is plus 11. So my final answer for part A is 11 minus open bracket x plus 2 close bracket all squared. Now, part B, use your answer to part A to solve this equation. Now, what we can see here is that um, we're just replacing the x each time with y plus 3 each time. So x equals y plus 3. So really, what I want to do now is actually solve part A, solve 4x, and then I can just substitute in and replace the x with the y plus 3. So that's what I've done up here. Having completed the square, I'm now going to rearrange this to solve for x. So I'm going to choose to add x plus 2 all squared to both sides, giving me 11 equaling x plus 2 all squared. Then I'm square rooting both sides. So x plus 2 equals the plus or minus the square root of 11. And then I'm minusing 2 from both sides. So x equals minus 2 plus or minus root 11. But what I'm saying is that x is being replaced by y plus 3. So y plus 3 equals minus 2 plus or minus root 11. Taking away 3 from both sides, I therefore get y equaling minus 5 plus or minus root 11. Part C. So the curve has equation of this. Uh, the point A is the maximum right down the coordinates of A. Now this is one of the strengths of having completed the square. When, once we've completed the square, it's very easy to find the maximum or minimum value. Now at the maximum or minimum value, the Y coordinate is maximized or minimized. Okay, so on this occasion it's going to be maximized. Now how do we maximize this? Well we're taking away something. So if we want to maximize y overall, we want to be taking away something as small as possible. In fact, we want to be taking away nothing. So how do we make the second component nothing? Well, that would be when x is minus 1, because minus 1 add 1 is nothing, nothing squared is nothing, nothing times minus 5 is nothing. So this second component here, uh, to make this 0, that is when x is minus 1. Now, when x is minus 1, all of this is 0. So y equals 3 take away nothing, which is 3. So x equals minus 1, y equals 3.